so today we have um, Dr. Dan Undersander with us. Um, he is a Forage Professor Emeritus from the University of Wisconsin. So I actually had the pleasure of working with him um, when I was a graduate student in University of Minnesota. Um, I met him when we were both kind of up, up that way. Um, but he is here today to talk to us about um, drying hay when Mother Nature doesn't cooperate. So um, I will go ahead and turn things over to you. All right. Uh, making hay is, is always a problem for us. And I, I do want to stress the importance though of really putting effort into making good hay. <coughs> uh, looking at those that were present, um, you need to consider that different categories of animals need uh, different qualities of hay. This slide doesn't show uh, sheep and goats, but uh, basically the uh, sheep uh, would be needing a relative forage quality of about uh, 120 to 130 and the milking sheep about the same as dairy. Um, just a, a couple principles though that I want to share with us in terms of really thinking about the value of quality. Uh, for the dairy side, milk production has doubled every 30 years since 1935. And the basic reason for this is what we have learned about forage quality. Back in 35, the uh, cattle were largely eating dried and headed out grass. And then as we learned about legumes and quality, we have gradually increased quality. The average milk production per cow in the United States is now a little over 20,000 pounds per year. On the other hand, it's important to keep in mind that we have a ways to go with dairy. Uh, the record cow produced 72,000 pounds of milk. Uh, it's three times the national average. And um, we have one herd in Wisconsin of 100 cows that is producing 40,000 pounds of milk twice the average, and he is doing it with 60 to 70% forage in the ration, uh, much less grain than many people are feeding. So the quality of the forage is crucial. The other thing <clears throat> to keep in mind for the dairy peop uh, beef people is that um, the rate of gain on pasture depends on pasture availability, uh, dry matter availability, but also the quality of that forage is being offered. And what you see here is a graph, uh, uh, generally, which I, you know, we can argue about, but what it basically shows is that the return per animal is higher as the average daily gain is higher. It makes common sense, I think. But what a lot of people don't realize is we need to be having our cattle gain uh, over a pound and a half a day in order to uh, be even at a break even situation as, as we're growing our cattle. So average daily gain and forage quality is important. Now, the reason that I am mentioning this here with hay is if we look at the picture on the bottom, we have to think about the quality of forage that we're feeding over winter to these animals. We have to think about the uh, body condition score of the cows when they calve in the spring and so on. The other consideration about making hay is that I've talked with a lot of farmers and they're wondering to themselves, well, should I cut my hay today or not? It might rain. And uh, what I have always stressed to farmers is to keep in mind that the quality of the forage is changing whether or not you cut it. And what we see here on this data from several years of studies that we did is that the uh, neutral detergent fiber uh, there in the middle um, is, increases four tenths of a point per, per day. And this is true for both legumes and grasses. So, uh, the header on this says alfalfa, but we've done a lot of grass work, uh, at least on first cutting where we have the stems in with the grass. On second and third, the change isn't so great. 
but uh, the first cutting is often the one where we have a high potential for rain and concern about getting the hail. The point being that the fiber increases four tenths of a point per day. Fiber digestibility goes down four tenths of a point per day. And so when we look at relative forage quality, we're losing about 3.6 points per day, which uh, on an open market uh, is something around uh, eight to $10 per ton, just on the market value of that quality. It actually worth quite a bit more in terms of the animal gain. Point being, if there's some threat of rain, but it's an uncertainty, then by all means, go ahead and cut. Because if you don't, the quality is going to go down. Now, let's talk then a little bit about some of the factors affecting drying rate. And uh, the major factors that most of us would think about, if you look at the uh, left-hand column there, would be solar radiation or sunlight, relative humidity, temperature, wasp density, and soil moisture content. And I oftentimes hear people uh, thinking about, for example, not putting hay in a wide swath because the soil's wet. And that's a serious mistake. But if we think about these, Solar radiation is the single most important factor in terms of drying hay. And if you look at the far right column, the difference between a cloudy and a sunny day can be as much as 48 hours or two days in drying time just due to solar radiation. I think we oftentimes uh, uh, do not really recognize the full value of soil radiation of so solar radiation. The um, and I think um, some of us might recognize this over winter when we see water dripping off of icicles when the air temperature is below freezing. The sunlight had more to do with melting that snow and ice than the temperature of the air did. And so if we go down this table. Uh, what you see is relative humidity will make a difference of about uh, uh, just under four hours in drying time. Air temperature, <clears throat> whether it's 50 or 90, um, is only about three hours difference in drying time. It is significant, but it is nothing as significant as sunlight. And then interestingly, the second most important factor in drying rate, which you as a farm manager can control, is the swath density. If you put the hay in a windrow when you cut it, it's going to dry slower than if you spread it out. And uh, we've uh, got lots of data and experience on this. A uh, lot of people continue to want to put hay in a windrow when it's cut and they're slowing the drying process. So. The first one you can't uh, change, uh, the biggest factor is solar radiation, but the second biggest factor is swath density and you control that and, and we will talk about that. Uh, let's consider <clears throat> how big a job we're undertaking when we cut hay. Uh, forage is something around 75% moisture when cut. Uh, this means that two ton dry matter yield must lose about 5.7 tons of water per acre to dry to 13% moisture. 1,370 gallons of water we have to dry off that hay to get it um, at an appropriate moisture content for storage in a bale. Uh, much greater moisture loss than most people think. Um, <laughs> The other consideration I would like you to think about is that what we're trying to do when we make hay is really to control or inhibit plant respiration. If that hay stays green <coughs> for a long time, then the uh, plant continues to respire. It breaks down the starches and sugars and that's just pure energy for your animals that are going off in the air. Uh, it's also weight loss, and we'll talk about that. Uh, the process is basically that glucose and fructose 
uh, and of course starch is a combination of glucose. For those of you growing grasses, you have mainly fructans, which are long chains of fructose. Uh, both of those are broken down. Carbon dioxide is given off to the air and you have lost some readily available energy. That respiration process continues until the plant dries to below 60% water. So you cut it at 75, you wanna get it dried down to 60 as quickly as possible to minimize that respiratory loss. Um, the data has shown that uh, this respiration can result in something between two and 8% of your total dry matter that was there in the field when you cut it. Now, I don't think that's as true. It's the high value is appropriate for us in the East as Western data, um, but it's not unreasonable from measurements we've taken to see a 4% dry matter loss due to respiration. So if we just figure um, this table is dry matter loss, two, four and 8% across the top. I just took hay at $188 a ton. You can adjust that to whatever price you want. But the point would be that if we're figuring, if we put it in a windrow, if we get our 4% dry matter loss, we're losing $7.52 per ton just in terms of weight, in terms of dry matter. Now, if we figure the quality associated with that, since the portion that we're losing is 100% digestible, what you see is that the uh, relative forage quality will go down from 153 to 130, and that works out to be about a $37 loss based on the current uh, marketing prices for quality of hay. So 37 plus nine is about $46 a ton. That's the cost of putting a hay in a windrow versus spreading it wide. The other thing of course is, is as we're drying hay, we need to control mold. And um, remember that they, uh, in yeast, and remember that they grow rapidly at 20 to 30% moisture. They consume nutrients, they cause heating, and we'll mention this quickly, um, and they produce toxins that are detrimental to animal health. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen a number of people that uh, had moldy hay that were feeding to their animals, sheep or, or cattle, <coughs> and um, cattle got sick. In some cases, if we happen to get aspergillus or something like that growing in the hay, the people can get sick breathing the dust and mold from that hay. So we need to be cautious about that. Uh, these molds do produce pores that if inhibited can cause sickness and disease. Um, so as, as I'm gonna skip that one, let's just talk quickly about uh, drying and um, we've done a lot of work on this there's been a lot of work done in new york uh, the tradition for the last 50 years has been to condition hay and put it in a wind roll like you see on the left rather than to spread it out wide this change came when conditioners came on the market in the 60s and 70s and uh, people were convinced that they could condition the hay and put it in a windrow and then they didn't need to spread it out wide. And I would like to suggest to you that that was absolutely wrong. Uh, conditioning breaks and dries the stem, a wide swath and intercepting the sunlight dries the leaves. Now if we're making haylage or baleage, we only really have to dry the leaves but uh, we can lose enough water to make a good product. But we do definitely need to dry the leaves. Uh, what you see in your grassy windrows, and all of you have seen this, uh, if you mow it and put it in a windrow, you come back the next morning, the surface is dry like you see, but inside is just as green as when you cut it. So that hay has been, first the drying is slowed, and secondly, you've had respiratory losses. I have measured inside windrows that were conditioned 
Uh, it shows two different trials here, but in each case, the relative humidity inside the wind roll, 20 to 30 minutes after the wind roll was made is nearly 100% humidity. Now, I think we all understand that stuff isn't going to dry much when it's close 95 to 100% humidity. And, uh, and that is what happens inside a wind roll when it is made. That is what has happened inside that wind roll when you see that green. So putting hay in the wind roll is slow and drying. It's causing you to have a greater likelihood of that hay being rained on. When we look at the drying, uh, what we see is that the um, first, uh, oh, almost 20%, of moisture loss from hay can come from the leaves through the stomatal openings. The stomata are uh, holes, uh, mainly on the underside, but also on the surface of the leaves that open during the day and let water out to cool the plant. And then they uh, take up carbon dioxide and let oxygen off. These stomata close in the dark at night. So um, I'll let you think about this, but, um, and, and again, our research shows this, if we spread the hay out wide, most of it's in the light and these stomata stay open. If we put it in a wind roll, most of these stomata in the dark and they close, and then your leaves are between two layers of wax. And that's why, in addition to the humidity inside the wind roll, that hay in a wind roll does not dry well. Uh, conditioning will help us take the hay from oh, with 60% on down to 20 and then after that uh, the, the drying is, is somewhat slower. But the most important thing is that to stop respiration, we need to keep the stomata open, we need to get rid of the first 15% water, dry that plant down to 60, whether we're making hay or haylage. Uh, and if we do so, we save more starch. So here's a picture of a leaf. You can see the stomata on the bottom, a red arrow, carbon dioxide going in, uh, oxygen going out. But when those stay open, the water goes out. When they close, then that uh, uh, conserves the water inside the plant. So we do want to keep that in the sunlight. When we make a wide swath, we intercept more sunlight and that's energy to evaporate the water. Think about this in those pictures I showed you the wind row and the wind rows that you might be making. You're probably the wind row covers 30% or less of the field. That means that 70% of the sunlight that falls on that field is not being used to dry your hay It's drying out the field. Secondly, we put it in a wide swath to so much stomates stay open. And lastly, we have less self-insulation, less humidity buildup. I think we all know that uh, hay is a good insulator. Uh, I did spend some time in Maryland a number of years back and uh, it gets cold there, but not like my native Minnesota where we tend to put hay and straw around the foundation of buildings to help keep them warm over winter. Hay is a good insulator. Um, so by spreading it out, we have more sunlight interception, stomach stay open, and less self-insulation. And then remember out of all this, uh, we tend to think about how fast we could get the hay or haylage up off the field, but really the first issue is how fast did you get the first 15% water loss? The, um, been some work done about morning versus afternoon cuttings and uh, well, there's some variation of data and of course weather is always the key factor but my recommendation everybody is to cut as late in the day as, as you can lose 15 percent moisture and so in the west we can cut at four or five in the afternoon and it'll dry down to 50 to 60 percent water by nightfall in the east, this generally means that we have to cut uh, noon or one-ish unless it's an exceptionally good drying day uh, because otherwise it's going to be wetter and respiration will be higher overnight. So 
I'm not sure what you all are using uh, on your farms to cut your hay. Uh, one of the things that I do want to uh, point out is this is why I am uh, frankly opposed to self uh, propelled mower conditioners. I don't pay attention to the color. Or they come in yellow and, and a number of different colors, but it's all the same. The problem with a self-propelled mower is you cut it and then it has to, the wind row has to fit between those two front wheels. So that limits you to about a five foot wide swath, no matter how big your cutter head is. Versus if you see the uh, two mowers on the right, uh, you can see that each can uh, cut and put hay into the full width of the cut swath. So wide swath is important. The other thing is conditioning is important. And uh, <clears throat> we of course have flail conditioners and roller conditioners. Um, flail conditioners tend to scrape the stems. Uh, roller conditioners tend to break the stems. Uh, for most of you indicated, most of you are making grass hay, a flail conditioner would probably be the conditioner of choice for you. It is um, the less expensive, runs a little faster down the field, and uh, but a roller conditioner is the conditioner of choice for legumes, for uh, alfalfa particularly because a flail conditioner tends to knock too many leaves off. And again, we're losing yield and quality when we knock leaves off. So flail is for grass, a roller is for legume. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of studies on drying rate and so on and so forth. And I would like to suggest to you that um, the real big difference between the machines is the adjustment that the operator is, is using. Uh, there is not any large significant condition, conditioner drying effect, uh, whether you use a flail or a roller, whether your rollers are rubber or steel. Um, the main consideration in terms of conditioning and affecting drying rate is to, uh, is the adjustment. What I like to see after conditioning is that it should be severe enough that one to two percent of the leaves show a little bit of bruising. If you do not see any bruising on the leaves after you mow and condition something, uh, you know, make a round around the field and get off and look at the wind row, then maybe you should tighten up the conditioner a little bit. And then obviously if the bruising is more than uh, five percent, uh, then we should loosen things up a tad, save horsepower, uh, minimize our bruising rate. <clears throat> um, so these flail losses can be important. Uh, here is an example of an uh, area on the left, the picture was hand clipped, and you can see that there were fair, very few leaves on the ground in this case prior to mowing. And then you go look uh, on the picture on the right and you can see that lots of leaves have been left in the field, knocked off uh, during the conditioning process with a flail condition. Again, this, these were alfalfa fields. Um, so I, I do recommend flails for grasses. I do not recommend flails for alfalfa. So generally speaking, we want to cut with a begin with a wide swath. I suggest covering 70 or 80 percent of the cut area. For those of you that are afraid to drive on a wind row, this lets you put one wheel in between the swaths, and then the other one can oftentimes go near the middle of a swath, which has less hay than either edge of that swath. Conditioning is necessary for hay, but not for hay leaks. You think about it, we want to put our haylage up at about 60% moisture or even baleage, and we can lose that 15% from the moisture content of the standing hay just by putting it in a wide swath and letting the sun dry the leaves out. Uh, the other thing would be in terms of drying then, and each of you that make grass hay know 
that uh, we really do need to tend the grass hay. And I would recommend generally something around 24 hours after mowing. <clears throat> Grasses tend to go down to a flat mat. And after that, drying is difficult. Legumes, particularly alfalfa, tend to uh, keep more of a three-dimensional characteristic, a height. This is why alfalfa grass mixtures tend to dry faster than uh, pure grass mixtures. So tend to loosen it up 24 hours after. We would not do this for alfalfa because again, it knocks off the leaves, but it is a good idea to do it for grasses. Uh, so generally, then the next consideration would be to rake merge at something greater than 50% moisture. Uh, depending on your conditions, um, that can be as little as 16 to 24 hours after mowing. Now, some of you making hay are going to be concerned about this, but uh, again, I would say what one of the things the data has clearly shown is that dry matter and leaf loss of both grasses and legumes is much higher as that hay gets drier. If you are gonna let it get drier, then the consideration would be to wait till there's some dew on that hay and rake it. Uh, so one option is to rake above 50% moisture. The other option is to let it dry more and come rake with a little bit of dew on it when it's a little bit tough that uh, will let you keep more of the dry matter in the process. So in summary, the first key thing is to lose 15% water as quickly as possible. Conditions is necessary for hay, but not haylage or baleage. Uh, condition alfalfa grass mixtures with a roller conditioner and grass with a flail. And then, um, I hadn't mentioned this, but uh, I'll show you a picture or two later on. Rake merge with minimal ground tack to reduce dirt in the forage. Uh, one of the things about going to a wider swath is it stays up on top of the stubble. And then if you have a rotary rake or a merger or something like that, you can rake without actually touching the ground. Uh, a lot of us use wheel rakes and uh, boy, that really increases the dirt that we're putting into the windrow. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about a few options then for really making the wet hay. And the first thing is, of course, I don't have any magic good answers. And I do think it is important to recognize though that when the environment is not conducive to drying, little can be done to improve drying. And the major consideration is that there isn't much moisture movement or drying. If solar radiation is low, if humidity is high, if temperature is low, and then of course those temperature and humidity cause a low vapor uh, pressure gradient, which is what draws the water out and causes it to evaporate. The big story here, I think, is if we have a lot of cloudy weather, it's going to be hard to make hay. And this is where a lot of uh, beef cattle people have gone to making baleage, at least on first cutting. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, that certainly is one way to get quality hay when uh, rain or lack of solar radiation, I will say, is slowing the drying of first cutting. But it is important to recommend that to recognize that when drying conditions are bad, conditioning or any other treatment has very little effect. Uh, again, uh, we talked about conditioning, um, but the other thing is there have been products to add to the hay to increase drying, desiccants we would call them. And basically these work good when the sun is shining and not when it isn't. Um, one of the things that I really want to talk about is uh, is the uh, relative forage quality of the leaves. Here's a picture pile of alfalfa leaves, but grass leaves are very similar in terms of relative forage quality. And in all cases, uh, while the leaves are a little over 500 relative forage quality, the stems are around 70 or 80. 
Now, when you're making grass hay, well, let's start with alfalfa first. Alfalfa for dairy should be cut at the bud stage. It's 50% leaf and 50% stem. If you're putting up hay or haylage that is much less than 50% leaves, then you have lost a lot of leaves in the harvesting process. And that's a yield loss and a dry quality loss. But the same thing is true with uh, grass. I think we all have seen hay from first cutting that looked pretty good. And we have seen hay that was largely stemmed. And if we had cut that hay uh, prior to <clears throat> heading, um, we should have had at least 50% leaves, but I've seen a lot of bales of grass hay that were 70 or 80% stems and therefore not the quality that we would like to see. What we have seen from alfalfa work that we did from uh, Pennsylvania to Minnesota and Wisconsin is that the leaf percentage is what really affects our forage quality. It's more important than maturity keeping leaves on that hay, either alfalfa or grass, is a key thing. More important than maturity, what's your percentage of leaves? The real reason maturity lowers quality is because it increases the stem percentage. If you're harvesting and increasing the stem percentage, you're doing the same thing. So here's an example where a student of mine uh, collected some and We'll use alfalfa as an example, but again, and I would say on first cutting, the same pertains to grasses. Um, he cut some standing alfalfa, the two bars on the far left, had 45% leaves and 55% stems. <clears throat> he sampled the windrow after it was mold, uh, mowed, and he had 42% leaves and 57% stems, so lost one or two percent leaves in the mowing and conditioning process. But in and this was harvested for haylage. In the chopped haylage, they lost another 10 percent of the leaves. And so the final product, where they started at a, just under 50-50, the final product was one-third leaves and two-thirds stem. Now, we've talked about quality of this for a long time, but I would like to think about yield for you because, you know, that yield that you're looking at costs you money. And, and frankly, it's a pretty fixed cost. It costs you so much to grow an acre of alfalfa per cutting. And then you divide by your yield and that's your cost per ton. So if we look at uh, this same graph on the previous slide, you can see on the right there, and then what I did was uh, we just made a bar graph of the uh, leaves on top and stems on the bottom. Again, about 45% leaves. And then I assumed that we didn't lose any stems in the harvesting process and that we only lost leaves. So this was the yield standing and this was the uh, mixture that was harvested. When we look at this, this represents a 16% yield loss. Saying nothing about quality at this point. The quality also went down. But this farmer lost 16% of the yield in the harvesting process, and this is making haylage. Data would indicate that hay losses are higher than haylage or baleage losses. Now we sampled about 30 some fields across uh, a couple states. And then uh, <clears throat> on the average, the standing or the pre-harvest of alfalfa was 52% uh, leaves. <coughs> Remember right at that 50-50 I was telling you about. These farmers were all harvesting alfalfa haylage. And on the average, the leaf content, we hand separated and measured it was 9% less in the harvested forage. On the average, these farmers lost 9% of the leaves in the harvesting and that much yield. Now, my thinking kind of is that that may be about as good as we can do. 
But what we have to think about is there were some exceptions. Here's a farmer that went down to 71% uh, leaves and 28.7% leaves. He lost a huge amount. Here's another one that went down to one third and two thirds. So uh, a portion of what I'm trying to suggest here is that a lot of the leaf loss depends on the operation and the way the farmer is operating. And we should, we want hay to dry rapidly. We start with a wide swath, but then the harvesting process also determines our loss. We do know if we put up hay too wet, uh, there's happen to be some hay bales. You can see that brown ring in the interior. Uh, this heated. While the cattle may like it better, we've lost energy, we've lost digestibility of protein. Uh, the other interesting thing you can see here is the insulating capability of the bale, and I'll talk about that. Look how the outer ring is not brown. Only the inner ring, which was self-insulated, heated and turned brown. Now, what we do know is that the more heating occurs, the more loss we have. And what you see is, okay. what you see is that the uh, TDN declines as the heating occurs over a longer, as more heating occurs. Now we define heating degree days as um, a degree centigrade in this case for one day. And what our data would actually show is that if your bale is say 10 degrees above air temperature for one day, you have a certain heating loss. If it's 10 degrees above uh, air temperature for two days, you have twice as much heating loss. So it's the, the amount of heat above ambient temperature times the number of days that heating exists determines the extent to which you uh, can uh, have loss of digestibility. And then of course, if the bales are stacked or too insulated, you can go on to fires, but we won't talk about that at this point. What, what we do want to think about is uh, we can put up haze wet. And one of your uh, scenarios for dealing with mother nature not cooperating is really how wet can we make our hay? Well, a little bit that depends on heat transfer conditions. And uh, what I'd like to suggest to you is we can put up hay wetter in the spring and fall when the air temperature is less because heat moves away from the bale faster. And um, then we can put up hay in July when the temperature may be 80 or 90 degrees. So we can put up wetter hay spring and fall when it's cooler than we can when it's really hot. The other thing, if we look down this list, is to think about uh, if we're going to make these bales, is to make them a way that heat transfer occurs. So we talked about cooler air temperatures. The other thing, uh, many of you, I'm sure, are making round bales. You may not have thought about this, but if you've got to particularly make some hay, it's not quite dry enough, but it looks like it's sure or predicted to rain tonight. Instead of making a four or five foot diameter bale, make a three foot diameter bale. And uh, the heat will transfer out more quickly. You can put up hay in the 18% moisture range. <coughs> and then of course, the other thing is to leave the bales uh, singly so that there is more surface area exposed to the air. Um, some growers, perhaps many of you used to talk about letting hay sweat a couple weeks and then stack them. And that was really the idea behind this. Let the respiration, let the heating stop. And the, the reason that we can have some wetter hay, if we have good heat transfer is that a certain amount of heating occurs, but in the process, the bale is drying when that bale is dried, then the heating will stop. 
So our general recommendation, one of the things you may not have thought of that works against us is bale size. <coughs> if we're thinking of uh, square bales, some of you may still make the small square bales. Uh, we used to do that. You could bale those at 18, even 20% moisture. And in some cases, we would even stack them real loose and be okay. If you have, and I'm gonna call this a medium bale or something that makes around the three foot by three foot bales, um, we need to dry that hay down to 16% moisture because other, there is more insulation of the middle of the bale from the outside air. And then the large, those would be the half ton bales. Uh, then the large bales are what I'm calling are the four by four foot bales. I doubt that there are any of those in your, among you. Uh, the reason that these balers, we don't see them in the Midwest either. Uh, these are only used in the West. And the reason being that there the hay needs to be down to about 14% moisture. And very frankly, we can hardly ever get hay that dry and neither can you. So we can get it down to 16, but the difference between 16 and 14 is a huge difference. The other thing I might say, those of you that are thinking of going to the larger balers, um, one of the things that the, uh, we don't often talk about is that as we go to a medium bale, we probably should figure on using a hay preservative like copreonic acid more than we did when we were just making the small bales. Now the same thing is true with round bales. A four by five, we can put up at about 17% moisture and, and there's enough air exchange that it will dry with a minimal heating. A five by five bale, uh, we need to be down around 16% moisture and then the five by six bales need to be drier yet. Again, the meaning of this is if you've already bought the machinery for the larger bales, realistically, you need to be thinking about using preservative on the bigger bales at a higher rate if you want to make hay that doesn't get rained on. Now, <clears throat> let's think about the uh, options for drying in a poor environment. Uh, we need about 14% moisture for a one ton bale, as I just said, to avoid molding, 16%. Um, but even with small square balers, uh, you'll see variation across the field. And there are some tools that are kind of interesting. One company is making a, a moisture tester. <laughs> there are two things I like about it. One is it adjusts the flow rate of the preservative to the wetness of the hay being fed into the bale. But the other thing it does, I don't know if you can see uh, horizontally on the middle of this bale is a line. It will mark the bales that are wet. Oftentimes in our fields, we have some wetter spots and dry spots. If you can mark the wet bales, you can handle them separately than the dry bales that were made in the field. A couple quick comments about hay additives. Uh, there was a lot of work, uh, oh, 30, 40 years ago about drying agents, potassium carbonate, calcium carbonate, and so on. They really do work on alfalfa, not so much on grasses. But again, they've kind of fallen into out of use because you needed to apply a large volume of water. And more importantly, they only work good on good drying days. So they're not going to help you with a bad drying day. There are a lot of uh, hay additives, inhibitors that are made. And, uh, and two considerations. Uh, for those of you making grass hay, you have ammonia as a good option. I don't know if any of you are using this. It's a little bit hard to work with, but it really does work. Uh, it's a devil for people working around the hay, but we've done a number of trials. It's one of the times when sheep and cattle are different than humans. We can't stand ammonia and they just love it. We'd put some ammonia treated hay side by side with regular hay and they'd always go eat the ammonia treated hay first. Um, but the most common uh, effective inhibitors are propionic or acetic acid and we would use the buffered form, the ammonium propionate, the ammonium acetate, because they're not as hard on 
the operator or on the machinery. A uh, lot of companies have been selling bacterial inoculants, none of them work. Uh, do, do consider that uh, propionic and acetic acid. You have to apply the amount in, um, in proportion to the wetness of the hay. And, and that's where um, some sensors are, are useful to you. Otherwise, you have to guess what the average is and apply the propionic or acetic acid in proportion to the wettest or, or nearly wettest hay. <coughs> Um, I think that this will let us preserve hay up to close to 24% moisture. I don't like to go much higher than that because it, it will preserve if we put enough acid on, but then I think the acid gets prohibitively expensive. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is once we go above that 24 range, as that bale dries, it becomes very loose and a little bit more difficult to handle. I would like to suggest to you that that propionic acid, um, if the hay isn't going to completely dry, will probably preserve the hay for something around nine months. If it's stacked, it can be a bit more because again, you're insulating and keeping the propion as well as the water, uh, but it will not uh, permanently preserve the hay. The uh, the next option is to wrap the bales in plastic. And this is what a lot of beef cattle people have been going to over the last couple of years, uh, either to get a wrapper yourself, or in some cases you can find somebody to wrap for you. Uh, we have uh, several hundred uh, farmers here in the state of Wisconsin that wrap hay for others. So you can always hire somebody to come by and wrap your bales of hay. Uh, the concept of baleage, if you're not familiar with it, is that we wrap them in plastic. If, it, if the hay was below 50% moisture, <clears throat> which it probably would be if you were trying to let it get dry and didn't quite make it, uh, then you're just basically looking at oxygen exclusion. The uh, uh, fermentation is greatly reduced as we go below 50% moisture. I didn't read the first sentence, but that's important to you. We can basically wrap bales at any moisture between 20 and 70% and preserve that hay. The nice thing about baleage, while it costs about the same as propionic or acetic acid, is that we don't have to judge the rate in proportion to the wetness of the hay. No matter what the bale is, we pick it up and wrap it and it's preserved. Now, if the baleage is made above 50%, then we have both oxygen exclusion and fermentation uh, with the propionic acid. Uh, there's really no advantage in feeding weight, uh, no advantage in terms of quality, in terms of preservation. Uh, the main thing is that if your bales are not going to be consumed in 24 hours, having a little acid in them, will reduce the rate at which heating starts to occur again in the unwrapped bale during feed out. Um, the key thing is to put at least six wraps on. If any of you are baking baleage and you open your bale and you see some white mold around the exterior of the bale, that means oxygen got in. No other way around it. Molds only grow when they have oxygen, particularly that white mold. So that means either you didn't put enough plastic on or it was really cheap plastic and you should have put a few more wraps. I usually tell people if you go to the discount store to buy the plastic figure on using at least eight wraps. If you buy from a company that sells the wrappers and the products, then you can get by with six wraps of plastic on the bale. Um, and you can, of course, either wrap in a tube or wrap the bales individually, depending on your operation. I recommend the uh, individual bales for uh, herds of less than 50. Uh, as you go above that, then a tube is fine. If you have a tube, you'd like to take out two or three bales per day to feed, uh, because uh, even over winter, uh, the oxygen will start working on the face of the hay in that tube. And so if you're not taking out enough bales annually, uh, you will have heating occur back in. 
one of the big questions we have about bale wrapping, and particularly if I've got a neighbor or somebody coming over to do it, is how soon do I have to wrap it? And the answer is the sooner the better. But we did a study where we wrapped bales. If you look at the legend down here, either without wrapping, and this hay was 36% moisture, uh, or we wrapped immediately, or 24, or 48, one, two, or three days later. What you see with the purple line is that the hay in that bale got up to, well, it went actually over 130 degrees Fahrenheit, but it basically stayed above 120 for three weeks. There was a lot of respiration going on, a lot of loss of, of quality in that bale. This is from an unwrapped bale. On the other hand, when we wrapped the bale immediately, the yellow line, you can see that uh, in about seven days, that bale got down to ambient air temperature. Now, so what happens if, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, the red line is the zero. It went up to about 100 and then went down to ambient temperature. We wrapped it 24 hours, it got hotter, but as soon as we wrapped it, we had shut off the oxygen and it started cooling off and was down to air temperature in about a week. Now, if we went to uh, two days or three days, you can see actually this light blue line at three days, 145 degrees, that was real close to burning. But again, as soon as we wrapped it, the air temperature in about seven or eight days, the, the bale temperature went down to air temperature. Um, so the moral of the story is, if you can't get it wrapped immediately, even if it takes one or two days later, you're gonna have some loss due to heating and some quality loss, but still wrap it. Now we can bale in the rain. Of course, those of you that have done wrapping know you can't wrap in the rain. The plastic gets wet and it slips. So, but you can haul the bales into some kind of a shed and wrap them while it's raining. Um, nothing wrong with doing that. <clears throat> the last thing would be, of course, to make haylage, and some of you may be doing this, chopping, either putting it in a tube or a bunker. I mean, the reason that we in the Midwest make so much haylage, over half our forage is harvested this way, is because we have trouble with rain in the spring. When you're making bales, be careful of uh, dirt and other debris. Uh, I particularly like the picture on the right there. That's a badger in that bale that uh, got into the windrow and got wrapped up in the bale. So in general, when we're trying to make hay and mother nature doesn't cooperate, first consider the need to lose the first 15% water. Obviously you're not gonna mow if it's raining You'd like it not to be raining for about 12 hours, so you can lose that 15% water. Uh, then condition alfalfa and alfalfa grass mixtures with a roller conditioner, grass with a flail. Rake merge with minimal ground contact to reduce dirt and other contaminants. Additional tedding is often necessary for grasses. You can use preservatives, and frankly, I think it's getting to the point where the technology is there on several of the balers that you can uh, buy equipment to um, or rent from somebody to um, portion the preservative in relation to the quantity needed for the moisture of the hay in the bale. If you get a wet spot to the field, this newer equipment will use more preservative. If you get a dry spot in the field, it We'll put little or none on. And then the last option that a lot of beef cattle people are going to is to wrap the bales in plastic. It is a clear way to um, put up quality hay. It's actually um, good for a lot of people that have part-time jobs and have to work. Because if you're making hay, you mow it one day. With grass, you're going to tet it the next. And then you just have to wait day after day until it's dry. And the chances of having four or five days without rain are minimal. 
Uh, but on the other hand, if you're going to make baleage, you can mow it today and you can plan on baling it tomorrow night when you get home from work. It will have lost that 15% water. You don't know exactly what the moisture will be, but it will be below 70% and you can bale it. So you can work it onto your calendar a lot better than you can otherwise. A lot of advantage to wrapping bales in plastic for uh, beef, uh, sheep, and, uh, and dairy. And I think that's the end of my presentation. So I'll stop my screen sharing. So thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we do have a few questions and we have a little bit of time so we can um, go through the questions. So the first question is, uh, what about wind impact on drying time? Uh, <clears throat> It's important to have a breeze. Uh, your, your person's point is correct. The idea is that water evaporates. It hangs around the windrow or the swath like a coat. And if you've got something to move that off, then you um, will have the option for more water to evaporate. So yes, uh, wind speed is important. It just wasn't one of the top five things. <laughs> Great. Um, so you um, kind of, I think, already covered this a little bit at the end when you were talking about uh, baleage, but this person asked, what do you think of hay in a day and how it relates to this discussion? Well, the hay in a day really comes back to uh, haylage or baleage. And because um, there's no place that can get hay dry enough that it's truly hay down to 13% moisture in 24 hours. But we can get it down to 55 or 60. We can wrap it as baleage. And I think, as I said at the end of this, I think it's a good process for first cutting. I think for a lot of the uh, people in Maryland and Delaware, it would be a good practice to think of baleage for first cutting and then dry hay for second and third when you're likely to have greater drying weather. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, the next question is, how does the addition of drying chemicals impact the forage nutrition? The uh, drying chemicals would be propionic or acetic acid uh, or ammonia uh, for grass hay, but uh, all of those are naturally occurring in the rumen of a cow or a sheep and are in fact uh, chemicals in the normal breakdown of hay. So you're adding a minimal amount, but you're not adding anything that's foreign to the animal in the digestive process. They also mentioned salt in their question. Yeah, um, there's a long history of adding salt. And again, uh, First off, there's no data that says salt does anything other than make the person feel good like he's doing something. Um, but the other side of that is that you're not adding enough salt to damage the hay. It is a way to get some good salt intake for the animals rather than salt block if you do that. I see one question that came up was what about tedding right after mowing? I don't know, it popped up on my window. Um, I do, uh, so that would be an option for, for grass. If, um, if you uh, pet it immediately, your leaf loss will be minimal. And if you, um, and, but you spread it out and you've allowed the drying. I just would rather see a wide swath made initially and avoid the petting because it's one less trip over the field. It's less traffic on the field less labor and less gas. Um, great, so the next question is, uh, apart from the effect of the different conditioners on leaf loss, do you have any insight to the influence of different mower types on leaf retention or loss? Um, So I'm not sure exactly what is meant by the question. If we're thinking of sickle versus disc mowers, uh, there's um, no... 
Go ahead. Oh, you said like flail, rotary, scissor, etc. How does that impact um, leaf retention? Oh, um, so some people, I don't, there's no data on flail versus rotary. Um, I would imagine it's uh, about like a flail conditioner. Uh, the, uh, the sickle bar versus the rotary, we don't see any difference in leaf loss. Okay. Um, and for what reasons do you recommend a flail conditioner for grasses? And also, what about for a mixed grass legume? Uh, Two reasons. One is a flail conditioner is less expensive than a roller conditioner, and I'm always trying to do things in the least expensive way. <laughs> um, the other reason is that we don't see the leaf loss in grasses that we see in legumes. So the leaf loss is enough to shift towards the more expensive roller conditioners for alfalfa. Uh, my Then when you talk about mixtures, um, I kind of go with, are you harvesting mainly alfalfa? If so, consider using a roller conditioner. If your mix is predominantly grass, then I would stay with a flail conditioner. Okay, uh, thank you. So I think this is the last question. Um, if anyone has any more, uh, feel free to you know, add them to the chat box. But um, this question is, what is a tool that a landowner can use to measure the amount of moisture in their hay? Um, there's not any real good ones, to be real honest. There are a lot of moisture probes, uh, both capacitance and resistance, where you have a little box and a, a probe that sticks out some number of inches. But most of them only work in baled hay and only if they're calibrated. Uh, the other thing I would say is that some of the most of the newer balers are coming with the possibility of putting a moisture instrument on the baler. Uh, that's probably the best way because you can see a, a flow across the field. Uh, I, I lived in Maryland for a couple years and I know that uh, there aren't many fields that are exactly the same from one side to the other. <laughs> and so it's important to recognize the variability that occurs. Uh, so, so there are on machine moisture sensors, there are um, the resistance probe which work in bales reasonably well, especially if you calibrate them. Uh, the other alternative is to take a sample and dry it in your microwave, and, and that works very well, too. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's all of the questions I see. If I missed anybody's, um, feel free to re-enter it or, you know, raise your hand or get our attention somehow. Um, but I think with that, um, we will kind of wrap it up and move on to our next talk. So. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Understander, for coming and speaking with us today. Mm -hmm.